In 1741, Puritan minister Jonathan Edwards preached a now historic sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He used the word anger three times, angry six times, fierce 17 times, and wrath 51 times. Listen to a few of his words. Wicked men are now the objects of that very same anger and wrath of God that is expressed in the torments of hell. Yea, God is a great deal more angry with the great numbers that are now on earth. Yea, doubtless, with many that are now in this congregation, who it may be are at ease, than he is with many of those now in the flames of hell. Edwards clearly wanted to make a point about God's feelings. Today, few American ministers would dare to preach such a relentlessly threatening sermon. Fred, God Hates Fags, Phelps, of Topeka, Kansas, has been able to garner national media attentions with his theology of rage, in part because he is an outlier. Popular sermons today are more likely to focus on promises than threats. The late Oral Roberts promised, among other things, that devotion to his kind of Christianity would be rewarded with material wealth, and he became one of the founders of a school of theology now known as Prosperity Gospel. If you search the internet, you will find all kinds of Christians arguing that God is not angry or fierce or wrathful, just righteous and bound by the obligations of justice, and aggrieved. This hurts me more than it's going to hurt you. But if we are honest, Edwards was closer in his vision to many of the Bible writers than was Roberts, or today's celebrity preachers like Rick Warren or Joel Olstein. Consider these verses. I will tread them in mine anger and will trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and will stain all my raiment. Therefore will I also deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, and though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. The first of those verses is from the prophets, and the last from the book of Revelation. The wrath of God is present throughout the Holy Bible. Anger, as I have discussed, functions as an activating emotion. It is a response to pain and threat or simply being thwarted. When we are in danger or goal-oriented activities are frustrated, anger can make us more focused, persistent, and determined. Socially, it serves to prepare our bodies for defensive action by making us stronger, more alert, more aggressive, and consequently, more intimidating. It can be almost instantaneous, preparing our responses to threats faster than our conscious minds can even assess a situation. This is both the advantage and the disadvantage of anger. You might think that if someone is powerful enough, say for example, omnipotent, then anger would be unnecessary. The force that created the universe should have no need of it. For what? To make him more powerful? More able to focus? To break through inhibitions or fear? And yet, it makes a lot of sense that we humans would expect a person god to get angry. We expect all powerful persons to get angry. Consider the Bible writers. Their image of God as the most powerful person imaginable was modeled on an Iron Age chief or king who wielded absolute power over his subjects and who was beyond accountability. One example is the situation of Job, who became the pawn in a contest between Yahweh and Satan. As a test of his loyalty to Yahweh, his children, along with his other assets, friendship, wealth, and health, are taken away from him. When Job complains, God gets a little offended. Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. Absolute power allows caprice and cruelty. It always is maintained in part by fear, a level of fear that is virtually impossible to perpetuate 
without anger's unpredictability. Saddam Hussein might be thought of as a modern Iron Age ruler, holding together a nation made of tribal factions and kinship groups that were ever ready to dissolve into more primitive groupings. Hussein's ruthless brutality gave us a picture of what it takes to maintain absolute authority in such an environment. If you read the descriptions of the Israelite kings, even many of God's favorites, you will notice that their regimes are similar to Hussein's. They practice genocide and scorched earth warfare. They have female sexual slaves taken by force. They engage in all manner of palace intrigue. They murder rivals and they amass wealth, often claiming divine sanction for their worst atrocities. The consent of the governed is not even a consideration. In a context like modern Iraq or the ancient Near East, where disputes are often settled without recourse to police or law, formidability is a social asset. A man may kill his adulterous wife in part because doing so increases his status among men. Engaging in visible violence puts him in a more powerful position when it comes time to settle a land dispute or negotiate a business deal. Anger makes people more formidable in part because it seems so out of our control. A king, or God, who is known for his caprice, commands the full attention of his subjects. We no longer settle many disputes by force or even force of will, and evolving theologies reflect our changing cultural conditions. The angry God of Jonathan Edwards has been replaced, in part, by a God who has a wonderful plan for your life or who seeks a personal relationship with you. All the same, recent research by cognitive scientists Aaron Sell, John Tooby, and Lita Cosmides suggests that there may be a biological basis for our intuitive expectation that God is anger-prone. We often think of anger being the domain of powerless, frustrated people, but the opposite may be true. One of the ways that anger functions is as a bargaining tactic. As I said, it increases formidability, and consequently, when I get angry, you pay more attention to my desires and less attention to your own. But that only works if you stick around. Most of us dislike being around anger. We don't like to feel like we are, quote, walking on eggshells. So generally, we try to avoid others who are chronically irritable, in particular if their anger is unpredictable or dangerous. But the equation changes if the angry person is powerful. Powerful people are those who can inflict costs on us if we don't pay attention to their wishes, or who can confer benefits when we do. They can reject us or injure us or even kill us. Or they may be able to give us special privileges like wealth or sexual favors. With powerful people, we want to avoid their anger while staying connected. So when we figure out what makes them angry, we tend to become more compliant. In a study by Sells, Tooby, and Cosmides, Stronger men and more beautiful women were more anger-prone than their less beefy and more ordinary counterparts. The researchers theorized that these kinds of people, in our ancestral environment, could have inflicted violence or offered premium reproductive benefits. Having more ability to threaten or more to offer creates a sense of entitlement, which, when violated, produces anger. It is one way that high-status people get the rest of us to do what they want, and because we value or fear them, they get away with it. Who is more powerful than God? Who is more able to inflict costs or confer benefits? It may be that we are biologically predisposed to be anxious about God's wrath, but the fact that we are disposed to expect something doesn't make it real. Our minds are optimized to help us anticipate and adapt to the feelings and desires and behaviors of other humans, including high-status humans who have the power to make our lives easy or wretched. It is far too easy to take this same template and project it onto the universe and beyond. The Bible writer's belief in an angry God may be essentially an artifact of social evolution and information processing. When we talk about God, most of us are trying to glimpse a reality that is external to us, not trying to learn something about the architecture of our own minds. We want to know, are we sinners in the hands of an angry God, not just sinners in the hands of angry humans? 
And yet, it is only by seeing ourselves that we have a shot at seeing beyond ourselves.